welcome everybody to this important um, town hall meeting. Um, just in some opening remarks, I want us to all just uh, pause for a moment. Um, today, there's almost 4 million people that have been diagnosed with coronavirus and over a quarter of a million people have died. Um, each of those are probably mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, nieces, nephews, and have families and communities. So we just need to, as we continue talking about COVID, you know, really keeping our front and centre the lives that are lost and the families that have been impacted all over the world. Um, Age-friendly environments are environments that are better places in which to grow, to live, work, play, and to age. And age-friendly began back in 2007. And I want to acknowledge Dr. Alex Kalash, um, who was really the innovator and the leader of this back in 2007. And the first publication was Global, Global Age-Friendly Cities, a guide directed by the World Health Organization. Age-friendly environments can enable older people to age safely, to be included, to participate and contribute to their communities while retaining their autonomy, dignity, health and well-being. I also want to acknowledge Alana Officer and the team at the WHO. You know, Alana, through her leadership and the team and affiliates and cities and communities all around the world, you know, are well placed you know, to guide, to advise and provide experience in this particular time. The decade of healthy ageing has four areas of focus. And one of those is age-friendly environments. So it's timely that we welcome Catherine McGuigan to our town hall. Let me tell you a little bit about Catherine. Well, first of all, Ireland and what's happening. Ireland was the very first country in the world to be affiliated with the World Health Organization's Global Network of Age Friendly Cities and Communities. So it's a country that's affiliated. It's the first in the world. And there's, a very, there, there's lots of reasons why this has happened. It was set up in 2014 to coordinate and provide guidance to the state's 31 local authorities. And Catherine's been quoted as saying, this was all done without any new money from within existing budgets. And that's a call that every, every government wants to hear. But I can tell you, Catherine is absolutely formidable. She is the Chief Officer of the National Age-Friendly Island Program, focusing on ensuring Ireland is responsive to the increasing needs of older people. Catherine is a Principal Advisor at a strategic level, engaging with key leaders across sectors and consulting democratically with citizens. But there's something about Catherine that strikes me that is unique. Catherine's a champion. She's a visionary. She's a great listener. She's a builder of relationships that stick. She has energy, enthusiasm, and power for positive change. So being around Catherine is just contagious. And so I really welcome Catherine to this town hall and, uh, and ask you to give us some opening remarks. Good morning, Jane, and good morning, everybody. And thank you so much for those lovely warm words. Um, as I say before, when I hear remarks like that from somebody like you, Jane, who internationally we hold in such high esteem, I'm very, very humbled. And I suppose in terms of opening remarks, um, I have the, the privilege of working in Age Friendly Ireland and have done for the last, I'm in my 11th year now, and I suppose for 25 years I've worked with, for and on behalf of older people. And that has been my privilege because I suppose from that perspective, we're looking after the current population of older people, but we're also providing, a, I suppose, a response for our future generations. And that's what this is really at the heart of. Um, I just want to thank you, Jane, for giving me the opportunity to present today and to talk through, I suppose, some of our experiences. And I really, really hope my, my, the, what I present today has the opportunity to inform other countries. And, and as I suppose one of the things at the outset is anything we share today 
we are very, very happy for countries to use and to utilize. But also I welcome any learnings that we can take as well because there's plenty that we're doing right, and, but there's plenty of opportunity for us to improve. So I really hope it gives us that opportunity today. So I, I'm delighted to share the journey with you. Um, before we actually moved into the formalized age-friendly Ireland setting in 2014, we had done uh, about five years work beforehand. And as Jane referenced there, there our, our foundation and our, um, I suppose our, our, our fundamental document was positioned in the WHO framework. And when the, the study was done with 33 cities across 31 countries with the WHO to find out what, what is age-friendly, what does that mean? Um, Ireland were, or participated in that through the, um, the city of Dundalk. It doesn't actually have full city status, but it participated because we had the right components to be able to contribute to that framework. So that was our foundation. And I suppose just at the outset, in terms of our governance structure, um, Ireland is obviously a, a democratic republic, um, and we have 17 national uh, departments, government departments. Within that context, we have 31 local administrations, as you would know as county councils or local authorities. So when we started the programme in three different areas, the first county that started was County Louth, um, which I know Jane has visited uh, um, uh, before in the last 11 years. And it started, and basically um, we, we had an organisation called the Aging Well Network, which was quite a revolutionary organisation. It was spearheaded by a woman called um, uh, Anne Connolly, another visionary. And she said she had this, she had worked in engineering and construction, and she said, let's take a design and build approach. Let's try and build this up because we don't really know what it is that we need to do to become age friendly. We have the framework, but in an Irish context, let's take that approach. And very rapidly, we started in one local authority because local government in Ireland has multiple, um, it's multifaceted, it provides roads, planning, transportation, housing, water, environment, community services. And I suppose because of the broad range of services that it provides, we thought in terms of multi-sectoral approach, it was the best as a host. And, and the framework, the WH framework, framework had indicated a municipality led approach. So it started there and we de designed, I suppose, a model which was started to be replicated out through all the other local authorities. And there were 10 key critical success factors. And they're all captured in our methodologies. Uh, I know Andrew will share the link to our resources, but all those resources are there. And, and what were they? It was the leadership of the chief executive of the local authority, the appointment of a role, um, an age-friendly program manager role, um, the creation of the voice of older people, which to this day will remain our core uh, function. We never, we said we would never be just a bunch of service providers that would sit around deciding what was best for older people. And within that context, we had to ensure that we didn't just get, I suppose, a cohort of older people that were not representative. We know older people are not an homogenous group. So we wanted to get younger older people, older older people, people with affluence, people in social deprivation, rural, urban, people with specific needs, complex needs, chronic conditions, um, people that were isolated and lonely, people that were very active and proactive, people in nursing homes, individuals. And I suppose that's always been um, one of our key focuses over the last 10 years is that we will ensure that that voice has continued to be heard. So that structure very fast track and very quickly was replicated across all 31. And then at the end of 2016, um, the, the program had been funded philanthropically and the decision had to be made where the program would go. And the options were, was that we, you know, did we, we just continued with a local program in each area with no central coordination and they knew that wouldn't work. Did it continue in its own uh, way, looking for, you know, external funding or would it become embedded as part of the, the statutory uh, program? And the program for government in 2014 had indicated that we would start to create shared services in Ireland. And really what that means is local authorities will take the leadership in hosting a particular service on behalf of the whole local government sector. And that's where Age Friendly moved into. It went through a whole post process and I suppose a peer review was done on the model that we selected. And then multi-annual funding was secured to host the Age Friendly Ireland programme. The caveat to that is it has not become an age friend or a local government only programme. It's hosted by local government, but it belongs to everybody. It's multi-sectoral. We work across public, private, NGO, academia, and citizens. And I suppose in effect, we've continued the model and we just have, uh, I suppose, a more statutory hosting and that we will continue. 
And that has brought great strengths. And I can talk a little bit about that later, about how we've become really embedded now in policy. And the strategic objectives of it are is that we continue to um, escalate local issues that have national influence, uh, particularly in relation to older people's needs, um, that we give technical guidance and support our 31 program managers and their networks across the country so that we don't need to reinvent the wheel. And that goes back to Jane's point that everything we've done, we, we said we would not create new budgets, that we would look at our existing budgets and build age friendly into that. So if we're doing housing developments, they would become age friendly and bring in universal design and age friendliness within that development. Parks, recreation areas, physical designs, transportation, all of those, we would bring age friendly in without saying we need a budget to make it age friendly. And that's always been our mantra from the outset. I suppose in response to, to uh, uh, just to mark at the end of it in December, we were so privileged that the WHO came to Ireland and with our Taoiseach, which is our prime minister, they acknowledged Ireland as being the first affiliated age friendly country in the world, which was a huge privilege for us. And I suppose on that, the, the, the task now is to maintain that and continue to share our learnings internationally with yourselves and learn from others. I will say that that doesn't make us a completely age-friendly country. There is an awful lot that we have to do. Up until January of this year, we had plenty of people waiting on trolleys. We have um, a homeless crisis in Ireland at the minute. And all this, I suppose, has been completely overshadowed by the pandemic. And I just want to acknowledge um, the passing of all those people in Ireland. We have lost um, uh, 1,403 people and we have about 22,500 cases currently. But just to talk about the response, and I think this is uh, really um, where we have come into play, is that I do believe that the programme and the fact that we've captured the voice of older people has enabled the country to be aware of the challenges um, that, uh, that face older people and that they're not an homogenous group. I think that uh, one of the key things that we've done is the community response team. So each local authority was asked to establish a free phone number, which was staffed 24 hours, or sorry, seven days a week, 12 hours a day. And what they did was a very practical response. Our age friendly program managers were pivotal in that. They developed them, they set them up, and some of them actually even staffed the, the phone lines to get an understanding of what the needs were. And at the end of April, we had received 24,000 calls from across uh, the country. And the practical guidance was, you know, if somebody needed their shopping picked up, the volunteers would go and pick them up, their medications, transport, non-COVID transport, COVID transport, um, health and wellbeing supports, any kind of guidance that they needed. Older people who were being asked to stay at home and cocoon at home um, have been able to do that. Uh, with that response, and I suppose that leads us into the legacy from this, that we will continue to play a role in making sure that people can stay at home and not have to transition maybe into long-term care prematurely. At national level, the, uh, the, the government has responded through a national public health emergency team, and we've done quite a few things. The country has, I suppose, their initial priorities were making sure that we had enough ICU beds and they had to ramp up PPE. So we have capacity with 1,200 ventilators in the country. And um, as of yesterday, that has been the, the, the amount of ICU beds, capacity within them has come down significantly. We've got our R number down from 4.5 to 0.5 with the social distancing because everybody has played their part and they've established 40 community response or community uh, assessment hubs which have enabled people to go and self-isolate that maybe are living in multi-generational settings or cannot isolate in their own homes. They've also ramped up testing and we'll have capacity for 100,000 tests per week by the 18th of May and I suppose even across the different departments, the Department of Justice were very much involved in supporting people in direct provision. And um, the, the Department of Foreign Affairs repatriated a huge amount of uh, people to come home, but as well as that healthcare workers, we had um, established the Be On Call for Ireland project. Um, and as I say, this was led by the government and they got over 70,000 applications from um, a lot of them were retired healthcare workers who came back and said, I'm willing to come back to work. So I think across the country, um, there's been no stone left unturned. And there has been criticisms, of course, because did the government respond to nursing homes quick enough? There were the acute settings were very, very much prioritized. PPE was very much prioritized. But my sense is that they have tried very, very hard to respond to the, to the demands as they emerge very, very quickly in the midst of the pandemic. 
And in terms of what Age Friendly Ireland have done, because our Age Friendly Programme Managers, the 31 of them across the country, have been central to this, we've been given a lot of practical supports in terms of communication training for people that were coming in and redeployed onto the community helplines. We've done a daily newsletter, and I know Andrew will show that as well, or we'll give that out later through the website. It's a five minute roundup of all the daily information, because what we were hearing from older people is there's so much information. We're so terrified and so anxious and so fearful. We put a positive slant of national updates, local updates, right down to little practical projects that were happening across the country that people could get involved in or avail of services. And we're sending that out wide and far through all our structures. And I suppose just in terms of our, our, our structures, and again, it will be available on the website to look at, our national governance is made up of four uh, departments with four assistant secretaries, um, an assistant commissioner from our police force, uh, the business community, national directors from the health services, and three of our chief executives from 31 chief executives across the country. We also have the 31 program managers come together and the 31 chairs of the older people's councils come together. And another core part of our structure is we engage with the whole NGO sector, the NGBs. We have about 13 non-governmental organizations or national charities in Ireland that provide a huge array of supports for older people. We bring those together three times a year to talk to them to, so that we're making sure that their needs and the cohorts of people that they're looking uh, after and, and working with are brought into our strategies. So I suppose in terms of the national network, that's what the Age Friendly Ireland office does, but it's very, very much in by the local response. So um, I believe one of the key things that we're doing is we're creating um, a, a report on all the responses, the local responses. For me and where my passion comes from, there is nothing more important than hearing what happens at local level. And I suppose I'll just finish up by saying that the volunteers and the volunteer response in Ireland has been overwhelming. Sporting organisations, we have 16,000 community and voluntary organisations across Ireland, but we had individuals coming and saying, I have three to four hours to spare a week, I have two hours a day, and they wanted to register through the community response team. And that has been quite overwhelming because when those people have come together with the community response teams, the dividend that they get from contributing and giving help out to older people and to people are cocooning, it has, it has been quite phenomenal. And I suppose the last thing I'll say, I'm just conscious of time, Jane, to, to open it up to questions. One of the concerns that Ireland has at the minute is our CMO, our Chief Medical Officer, and the departments have, I suppose, raised awareness that there's a huge amount of people not presenting with, um, with illnesses. And one doctor was quoted as saying that he normally would have three to four potential cases of cancer per week, and he hasn't seen one potential case in the last eight weeks. And that's a real concern for us, and we're working on how we can support older people because there is a mixture, I think, of fear of um, uh, going to GP surgeries and going to acute settings. There has been cancellations, obviously, of elective procedures, which the, the HSE are now working on with private consultants and doing a very good contract service with the private hospitals in Ireland. But most importantly, a lot of older people, I think, I think it's their civic duty will not put additional burden onto the health services because they're snowed under. And the HSE and the Department of Health are saying to people, you must come forward. And I think that's something that we have a critical role to play in now through our older people's councils is getting out to those voices and saying, you must encourage people to present because otherwise that would prevent another challenge down the line, which could absolutely be worse than, than what we're facing at the moment. So um, Jane, are you happy with that overview at that? Or do you want me to that's continue? Great. No, look, that, great. that's great. And thank you, Catherine, because now we've got some, you know, foundation pieces and you've touched on Ireland's response to COVID. So let's open it up to the floor. Before I do that, I just want to pause for a moment and thank the Government of Canada, because quite frankly, without the initial funding from the Government of Canada, the age-friendly program and movement wouldn't have got off the ground. And I know there's many Canadians in the field on this, uh, on this town hall today, and in particular, the work of Louise Plouffe. Um, Louise, I know, worked with uh, Alex 2005, 2007, um, and uh, you know, was one of those leaders, leaders in the field, as was Margaret Gillis at the time, and many others, Simone Powell, Rachel Milken, but we have lots of Canadians on the call today, 
who are living and breathing age friendly. So we thank all of those people. Um, I am going to call on uh, Ken Howe and Lorraine LeClaire to um, come forward and, and ask Catherine their question. Can you keep the questions really short if you can? So we can get lots of questions through. So Ken, where are you on the screen? You there? Okay, well, I'll give you the question. Um, so this is about safe and affordable housing, Catherine. Uh, it's a challenge in most countries, including Canada. Can you comment on models or guidelines that enable municipalities to create better housing options? Okay, I'm delighted to do that because it's been a critical part of our work, particularly in the last couple of years. So as of last February, um, the Irish government produced a joint departmental um, housing options for our ageing population, which we contributed to significantly. It was unique because it was the first joint departmental strategy across Department of Health and Department of Housing, which was really, really great. And the two ministers came together to commit to delivering this. We worked with them very much in terms of ensuring that we looked at the research that had been conducted already, but to engage directly with all the stakeholders. Um, which included all our older people's councils. So the, the direct voice of older people was heard in the development of that policy. The policy was produced in February 2019 and an implementation group at very senior level uh, was created to implement all the actions. Uh, what was really great was the two ministers invited two representatives from the National Network of Older People's Councils. So two citizens are actually sitting at that very strategic table so that we never uh, I suppose deviate too much from the authentic voice of older people. For me, that was a real win. In terms of um, practice and actions, the, the policy is up on our website. It's a really, really good example of what we need to do to ensure that we provide appropriate housing as we age, um, whether you're living in the rental sector, or whether you're owner occupier, or whether you're living in social housing. And that was what was really critical about the policy because it, it, it took a holistic view. And also that uh, health and housing are, are linked and that they're not two separate approaches when we're, we're talking about living independently in our own communities. Some really good examples um, have come out in terms of affordability and we're doing a right sizing research in peace at the minute. It's, it's, we did it quantitatively first and now we're doing it qualitatively to actually look at what are the challenges and what are the key critical factors for older people. And it's the obvious things like you know, if people are living in a five bedroom house that they can no longer afford to run, they're very happy to stay as long as it's within their own communities. And actually 10 years ago when we started, we had a much greater reluctance amongst older people to, to resize into different uh, uh, appropriate homes. And now they're really looking at, yes, I would be interested as long as I can stay close to my friends, my neighbors, my amenities. And we're also developing a waiting tool as part of uh, the, the, the um, policy around what are the important things around the physical design, the environmental design, the public realm, access to services, technology, and most importantly, social supports. So one example is there's a document called Thinking Ahead, which was produced by um, the housing agency, which we worked with them on very closely. And they have done a number of case studies across the country in terms of um, developments and they've clustered them into you know, housing with care, independent units, you know, what do they look like and what are the importance of them? And the, some of those are actually included in the housing policy. One that springs to mind in the relation of this question is Colivet Court in Limerick. Limerick is a, a large city in Ireland and they went into a very densely populated, um, what would have been a, a, a social housing development traditionally where people had bought their own homes. So those people over 65, in order to free those houses up for uh, they had capacities for family. The council went to them and asked them would they be interested in right sizing. They said they would. So the council bought their homes for thirty five thousand euro, and the council also paid their legal fees. And then they built a specific development called Colivet Court for those residents, which is right in the middle of the estate. So they stayed within their own communities in smaller bespoke accommodation. And the key of that is they brought in a few uh, things like underfloor heating thermal appliances and that, which has meant that their utility bills are almost like negligible and the houses are really, really warm and are really, really well designed. And even if you look at the floor plans of that development, it's a fantastic development. There, and there are loads of them, Jane, 
but this is just a specific example of how people can continue. So it has freed up a little bit of collateral. Their legal bills were paid. They've, and because they were over 65, they now qualified for social housing and came from owner occupier into social housing. And the houses were freed up for families that was much needed in the area. But as I say, there are case studies all across those, those different um, strategy documents. Okay, thanks for that, Catherine. And you'll have to keep your answers really short too, <laughs> all right? Yes. Um, but I think this is incredibly valuable information. And it just speaks to you know, the depth of knowledge that is within the whole model of Ireland. I want to acknowledge all of our friends on the east coast of Australia and New Zealand where it's very late. Um, so thank you for being on the call, Mark Tucker Evans and, and others. Um, let's now ask Lorraine Leclerc, then Anna from Portugal and Vijay, Vijay from India. So Lorraine, are you on the call? Yes, I am. Great. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity. One of the concerns that I have to deal with the immediate issues is the verbiage that's being used in some of our residences that are um, more of a terror approach than it is of a, grad, uh, of a sensitive approach. For an example, um, folks in one of the residences are receiving their daily newsletter, let's say, slid under the door, but in large black bold letters, they're don't go out, don't do this. And I'm trying to find a more positive, but direct approach in the verbiage of what they can use to not put the fear in our, in our residences that seem to be coming out more and more. I have direct contact with a couple of people that are in two different residences and the same situation seems to be popping up where it's more of a fear approach of stay home, be scared, don't go out, than it is something of, yes, we have a severe, serious issue. Um, so if anybody can contribute something along those lines of the verbiage that we could use when addressing the, the crisis of the day. Thank you. Catherine, I'll, I'll just ask you to hold there. I'm going to go to Anna because she has a, a, a similar but, but not the same question. So Anna from Portugal. Yes, I'm here. Hi. Hi, Catherine. How are you? I'm great, Anna. How are you? I'm fine. Uh, well, first of all, um, I want to thank for this opportunity. I want to explain quite uh, shortly. Age Friendly Portugal looks at Age Friendly Ireland as a, as a reference, and we are starting to have the same, more or less the same association here. Our focus is more on longevity economy. Um, and also to share with all of you that Spain is thinking about to create the same kind of association. So we are maybe seeing a confederation here uh, coming up. Um, I also want to, to ask you, uh, Catherine, um, how can we change or how can we, what kind of um, resources we should uh, take in consideration when we want to uh, deal with the government and uh, help them to change the, the vision, the, the concept they have about aged people. Because the problem here is they have a very narrow um, perspective. Um, and also to invite you, because we decided to move on here in Portugal with the campaign against uh, ageism. So it's something that we will we are preparing and we will launch on the second semester. Um, and if anyone who is uh, on this uh, webinar now wants to, to, to move on with us, so we, we, to, we want to do something that will not be only here in Portugal, but can be spread uh, around the world, ideally. So it's okay. just so, so let's Yeah, sure. So, okay. Catherine, perhaps you can respond to Lorraine and Anna. Okay, that's perfect. Very quickly, in terms of the verbiage, Lorraine, and I think that's really important. We, we realized that very quickly, probably about seven weeks ago, that older people were, were not appreciating the language, particularly through the media, uh, in terms of the, I suppose, the scaremongering. And particularly for people in long-term care facilities, there was always a fear that they felt very isolated from, from society. Um, I think one of the things we did in terms of language was our newsletter, the way it's orientated, the language that we use, the use of logos and colours and the positivity that it celebrates has been a real resource to practitioners, but certainly older people, 
and some of the community response teams post those out to the new, to the nursing homes or they're distributed through the rural transport or the postmen can take them and drop them off so that people can have a read even for five minutes about some of the positive messages and I think that's really important. Another initiative in terms of nursing homes, I don't know if you're exploring this already, um, a lot of uh, long-term care facilities in Ireland have asked for donations of tablets and smartphones and they've had a huge donation from civic society and then some of the care workers are helping people to Skype their partners. Some of these people, I, even at home, have never ever used um, smartphones before or technology and it's quite wonderful. So you've got the traditional family coming up and waving in the window but then you've got the older person in the nursing home that can actually use the tablet. And we did a lovely project, um, and I'll talk about it later on, maybe um, a year ago with a, an age, we actually designed an age-friendly tablet, which was somewhere between an iPad and nothing. And it's designed and customized for the use of older people and very, very easy. But the most important thing is designed by older people. So there are just a couple of initiatives where you can improve or improve the messaging that's going to long-term care. Um, in terms of uh, Anna, I, I, I'm delighted to hear from you, Anna, and delighted to see all the work that's happening in Portugal. It's, it's fabulous. And I think in terms of, of government, and if you were to ask me over the last 11 years, what did we learn? And I think it was the approach that we took in terms of our older people's councils. We had five core principles, and two of them were participation and collaboration. And we asked older people to come in, and not that lobbying in any way is a negative thing. Lobbying has been around for, for centuries and needs to be done. But from our perspective, we said we would simply ask people, but we would also ask them to co-design solutions. And I think because we brought them to the strategic table and you had the authentic, diverse voice of older people and not an homogenous group, that people were coming and saying, this is actually a challenge for us. What it gave it was great kudos because people were able to say, you know, this is actually what the challenges are. And if we reshape and redesign first our services and then our policies, we can really respond. And it was creating awareness about what the challenge is that demographic change is going to bring. And it's really saying, if we don't design now, we may have huge problems later on, whether that's in relation to housing or the other thematic areas. So I think it's because we brought people along with us the whole set of collaborators were all in it together and that would be my key advice for working with government at both local and national level. Okay thanks Catherine. I'm going to call on Vijay from Mauritius, my apologies Vijay, and then Bernard MacDonald who I think that you and I both know. That's so, right. Yeah. Vijay are you on, on, uh, on the screen? So, so Catherine, the, the question was pertaining to loneliness, you know, in the time of COVID, can you give an example of, of good practice where you've been able to respond to loneliness, not only in residential care, but also in the community? So I'll hold you there. And Bernard, are you on the line? Hello. Hi. Oh, is that yeah. DJ? Yeah, it's me, Vijay, I'm from Mauritius. Okay. No, there's no problem. Yeah, uh, I was, I, I have to congratulate you, Catherine, for the good work that you have been doing uh, with uh, Age Friendly Ireland. My question is just uh, focusing on uh, have you been able to outreach uh, all the people who are homeless in your program? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Vijay. Um, and Bernard, are you on the line? Okay, so perhaps if I can, I can frame the question, Catherine. Does the response of health systems to COVID in some countries with a strong age-friendly focus, up to and including proliferation of dependency narratives, and even the non-counting of deaths, raise profound questions about how effective the age-friendly movement has been in eradicating deep prejudicial ageist attitudes? I think that's a bit of a loaded question, Bernard, but I'll let, uh, I'll let Catherine respond to that and she will be able to. So about homeless, loneliness, and then about um, the prejudicial ageist attitudes and the effectiveness of age-friendly. Perfect, thank you very much, Jane. So um, just coming back to, to Vijay, uh, yeah, definitely in the housing policy, um, homeless older people were, were referenced because 
when you have chronic homelessness, whether it's to do with um, long-term addictions or whatever the case may be, as opposed to an acute scenario that has happened because of something economic, there tends to be, it's multifaceted. There's so many issues. I know our biggest local authority in Ireland is Dublin City Council. So what they have in play, um, VJ, is they will provide, um, they work with all the homeless uh, agencies and they provide obviously shelter and uh, different supports for people who are homeless, um, particularly those that are rough sleeping. People over 65 are immediately fast-tracked. It is a, an internal policy that if somebody who is homeless and is older, they're immediately fast-tracked in Dublin City Council. And it's an internal policy and obviously is replicated in other areas, but it means that there is priority given to them uh, because of the more complex needs. So I suppose from two perspectives, it's a practical example of how local authorities are responding to it, but also it's definitely something that's included in the policy that we need to be aware of. And, and the other thing that links to it slightly, and it's captured in the policy as well, is long-term renters, and where you've got an older person who doesn't have any stability uh, with a landlord, and there's um, legislative changes coming into play for that as well. So that's the way we've responded to, to, the, to homelessness, I suppose, as an issue for our aging population. In response to the loneliness, yeah, uh, Jane, as you know, we have lots of NGOs in Ireland that are doing really, really good things to keep people included. But in terms of in response to COVID, those have been ramped up. So friendly call services, daily phone calls, um, the, be the befriending obviously has stopped where people can't physically go into the home. So they've been replaced with really innovative ways in which we can reach out. And in fact, some of our older people's councils are actually taking up the friendly call service and calling older people that are being referred in through the community response team. The Men's Sheds, the Men's Sheds is an international movement, as you know, and they're setting up their own. They have online meetings and people are getting training to be able to join their, their meetings and chats and different things like that. Very informal ways of engaging. What's really, really crucial, though, is the people that are not connected to any services already so they're coming through the community response teams and the second phase of the community response has really been about looking at the health and well-being of older people and ensuring that they've got supports that they need so i feel that um, the identification of them has very much come through people like the postal workers the volunteers on guard the chicana which is our, our police service they're able to identify those people who are not engaged in services and through the community response team, they're ensuring that obviously they have the practical supports like shopping and medication, but also the additional supports and the daily interaction. So um, there's some good examples of that. And obviously I can share the narrative of those, Jane, down the line if people are interested in replicating any of those uh, services, even like the, our library service are doing a homebound service out to people who are not online and calling out with the books and they're pre-packed and they knock the door and people come out and have a quick chat with them and they do the, that delivery service. All those small things, I suppose, holistically wrap around to ensure that people are connected. Um, in response to, to Bernard's uh, question, um, yeah, I, I think, I mean, it's something that we've been discussing very recently, Bernard, and it's lovely to, to say hello to you um, uh, and to have a colleague from Ireland. Um, I think, uh, how influential has Age Friendly been well, I suppose Ireland, uh, uh, other countries, um, even our neighbours in Northern Ireland and the UK, haven't even recorded the deaths, um, as far as I'm aware, in the death rate in residential care homes or, or up until recently hadn't been. And I'm not sure if that was a case because they had difficulty being able to define what the cause, uh, the cause was or what the reason was. But I know in an Irish context, at least in terms of recording um, the dreadful death rate, uh, residential care has been included in that. And the question is, is, does that put some value? Does that add value? Has the programme been contributed to that? And I suppose, as Jane said, that's a loaded question. It would be hard for me to, to define if that's the case. I'd like to think that the hard work we've done has raised the profile of the ageing population and the importance. And I think if there's one thing we've done in an Irish context is they have provided good supports. Um, as I say, there have been inconsistencies. I refer to Mike Ryan, who's an Irish man from WHO, who said many weeks ago, two months ago, if you wait for perfection to respond, you'll be too late. So I think the government has tried to respond as, as quickly and as rapidly as could. Um, whether we have had a, a, a direct input to that, Bernard, it's really, really hard to know. I'd like to think that the programme has some way to, uh, went to supporting the voice of older people. 
Yeah, look, thank you, Catherine. If I can just chime in on that. You know, from an observer's perspective, what we've seen is that if there's a coordinated leadership approach, then it's much easier to actually scale up, to replicate across a country or community and respond in a more um, proactive way. So, you know, that's why the, the Irish model gives me great hope. You know, a national model is much more responsive, I would suggest, than, you know, isolated communities. But that, you know, at a community level, you're really responding to the community. And I think that's equally as valid. Um, so, you know, I think that your, your response, um, I'm, I'm in your tent. I truly believe that, you know, Ireland has been able to respond effectively, you know, to the needs of older people in Ireland, uh, moreover. Um, I do want to just, we've got a few more minutes to go. Um, so I want to make mention of Kobo. We've talked about the donation of um, um, iPads and, and readers. In Canada, you know, we have the pleasure of Mr. Kobo, um, Michael Tamlin Watts. And I know that Kobo has denote, donated thousands and thousands of e-readers around the world. So I just want to acknowledge, you know, that, um, that Kobo stepped up. Um, I want to call on Pazit and Stephanie just for two quick questions. And then I want to ask Sylvia Peril levin to just mention the webinar that's coming up. So Stephanie, are you online? Muted? All right, I'll ask the question. Um, COVID is illustrating that sometimes under the harshest of conditions emerge the best and most innovative of human impulses. You know, you've demonstrated that I think in Ireland. Uh, and uh, so would you like to make a comment about that, Catherine? Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, it goes back to some of the old adages about, you know, when crises happened, you see the true worth of people. And I think this country was definitely overwhelmed by the community response and the civic response. The amount of people that came out and said, I'm willing to, to help, I'm willing to do this. And I think what it ultimately did as well is it encouraged people who maybe traditionally didn't ask for help to say, look, I'm in this scenario and now I could avail of that. I think it's really, really important to look at the legacy from that, Jane, and I'll wrap up by saying that one on that question. We need to look at maintaining some of the key lessons. And for me, the whole social and community response that's been managed at local level and that local knowledge and still harnessing all that contributory um, uh, pieces from the civic society, from all the community involved organizations. If we truly want to support our aging population to live in their own communities, it's one of the key factors. And I think after this, there'll be some, I suppose, legacy pieces of work to say, what services do we need to continue that really, really contributed both to the pandemic, but can help in the future? Mm, thank you. Um, Pazit, are you, Pazit Livinger, are you online? I'm online. I'm not, uh, I'm just going to, because I'm on my PJ, it's late here in Australia, but <laughs> happy, okay. to have, um, happy to have this conversation. Uh, for me, I'm quite interested to see what approach um, has been used in Ireland with regard to physical activity and exercise, given the restrictions and, and if what has been done in terms of outdoor and built environment to encourage them to um, go outside and exercise. So it's really about exercise. How are you? How have um, you know? How have you encouraged older people to go out and exercise in this time where you know physical distancing um, mm. is, is asked for, and we're asked to be actually staying home? So how have mm. you balanced that? So basically, a number of the um, we have a, a sports partnership in each of the local authorities, and the first thing that they've done is they've devised physical activity programs for people to do in the home and. That's taken into consideration whether somebody lives in a rural area in five bedrooms or they're living in a two bedroom department. And there is age and opportunity, you also have the physical activity leaders. And we also have one in Ireland, a really beautiful program called the Exwell Medical, which is based on a clinical referral and has clinical oversight. And they have over 2000 people participating in their programs on a weekly basis that have chronic conditions. So they all devised home-based programs. Now, the next question is, how do they get out there if the person is not online, because obviously if they were online, they could participate, 
and do it in their own. Another one is Shield Blue, which is very much about people that have certain complexities. And it's, it's a great, great program. Last week, um, at the end of April, it had 120,000 views across the country. So a lot of the people who weren't online were facilitated to get online by the community response teams so that they could exclusively do physical activity programs. As a secondary, they've also produced booklets. A lot of the sports partnerships have put it into little booklets because some people like to actually be able to look at it and do them at their leisure without participating in an online class. And they've also been delivered as part of community packs to older people. This week, the parks are opening um, for two hours per day, recreation for two hours per day, exclusively for older people and people who are immunosuppressed and that are cocooning so that people can get out and get their physical walks. Because up to now, older people were being asked not to do that. And from this week as well, older people are being asked to, are they're, they're being said, been asked to go outside their home within five kilometers, maybe not interact with other people as much, but that they can use the open spaces to do that. So I suppose the first phase was very much bringing the physical activity into the home and now they're being encouraged to go out of the home. But again, it's about informing people. It's about making them aware that those are there, particularly, you know, paying regard to people that may not have online access. So Catherine, just, you know, I just want to make note of David Richardson's comments, who talks about the importance of a, a strategy um, as we move into what we will know as the new normal. So I just want to acknowledge, David, your comment. <coughs> um, one of the final questions is really coming from Catherine. Um, Catherine, um, Catherine Shulman. Um, and uh, she really is, is asking a question about post-COVID and austerity. In thank you for organising the town hall, curious as to how you think the reforms to the long-term long -term care sector promised in Ireland's slammed care plan will proceed in the aftermath of the pandemic. And this is a very big question that we need to be thinking about now. Post-pandemic, the austerity measures and usually, you know, the cuts start happening in health and social care. So do you mm -hmm. have any thoughts about that? Yeah, um, that's the, the, the slaughter care um, plan or strategy was it's, it's a whole of government approach and it was launched last year and they've done some significant things. It's about reforming the whole health care and a key component of that, Jane, is about how we look at ageing populations in our own communities and moving from our traditional long-term care and acute settings and moving them into community and primary care. Because we know we still go for our consultants' appointments to, um, you know, to hospitals when we could easily have community-based geriatricians, we could have advanced nurse practitioners, we could be using telehealth and remote technologies to do triage at home. And all of those things, I suppose, are in the plan. In terms of uh, the pandemic, I think what that's actually going to do is accelerate that because there will be a need. We've also demonstrated how community-based response teams can work really, really well and how making those organisations work together can actually fast track that. I think in terms of um, our Taoiseach was on, uh, our, our national programme is the Late Late Show and it's on a Friday night. It's avidly watched by probably the largest proportion of the population. And he said, I think we really need to look at this in, you know, very, very quickly and very, very soon. And instead of looking at the long term vision of providing you know, state-of-the-art long-term care facilities. We really need to examine what we've learned and get that moving quicker. So I was really, really, um, I suppose, uh, delighted to see him looking at that as one of the early things that he needs to do post-pandemic. Look, thank you for that, Catherine. And I'm just going to give you a breather because I'm going to come back to you in a couple of minutes and ask you, what are the takeaway messages that you want to share with you know, the attendees today? Um, so in wrapping up, I want to uh, just acknowledge that the UN humanitarian response to the pandemic with the great efforts of HelpAge, Bethany Brown and many others, UN DESA, um, it now has identified older people as a vulnerable group. Um, it didn't in the beginning and now it does. And that's the power of civil society and their advocacy. So thank you, Justin, Bethany, um, help age and all other civil society that worked so hard to make that happen. You'll see that there's many things that are going on in the chat box. And so the whole chat box is going to be taken away, you know, and 
um, filtered and sent back to you with comments, resources, and then it will be loaded onto the IFA website. Um, I want to acknowledge the IFA team and they're all on the call today and particularly Chesley, our incredible um, communications manager, and I don't know how you always do it. Also Andra for facilitating and planning these and also Anna, who is our lead in age-friendly environments. So Sylvia, would you like yes. to come forth and talk about this very important webinar that you're gonna have next week? Thank you, Jane, and thank you so much for this excellent uh, town hall, including today's. Uh, and last week you had an excellent town hall with Peggy Hicks from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights on the day that the Secretary General released a, a policy brief on the rights of older persons. We want to carry on the conversation, and for that we have been in touch with member states and the Office of the High Commissioner, and that's why we are bringing a, a webinar next week, opened by the uh, uh, ambassador of Chile in New York, who is the chair of the group of Friends of Older Persons. Then the High Commissioner for Human Rights will be with, uh, with us for 30 minutes. Uh, she will not speak for 30, 30 minutes, but she will be with us on the webinar. And the new independent expert. So this is our opportunity to welcome her officially and for her to hear from civil society member states and anybody who wants to uh, ask her questions and to um, give her ideas of what we are interested for her to work on. Mm -hmm. So this is a great opportunity to welcome her together with the High Commission for Human Rights. Peggy will join as well again. And then the ambassador of Slovenia, who they co-chair the group of friends on the rights of older persons in Geneva, will also be there and give closing remarks. And I will be there moderating and I'll be very happy to get your questions and whoever wants to send us remarks and we will include them. So it's Tuesday, 12th May, two o'clock in the afternoon, Geneva time, Europe, and eight o'clock, New York time, Toronto. Yeah, look, Sylvia, I, you know, IFA stands with you you know, in this incredibly important webinar and all of the leadership work that you do in Geneva. Um, who any, if you don't know Sylvia, her Rolodex must be very big because she can connect with those that connect. So it's, it's people like you that champion human rights, you know, in Geneva and connect around the world that we're grateful for. Um, it's very unusual, you know, to have you know, member states, ambassadors opening such webinars, very unusual, you know, to have the High Commissioner and a tremendous opportunity to have the new special rapporteur. So I really encourage everybody to be on this because it does mark the power of civil society to be on these webinars. So thank mm -hmm. you for that. Now, you. the final comments go back to Catherine and Catherine, um, our chat box is full of excitement, opportunity, resources going around. So please, you know, give us your final thoughts about this. Okay, thank you, Jane. And I suppose the first thing I'd like to say is thank you to everybody. I, I can see some of the chats coming in and obviously not getting to answer them, but I want to just say thank you to everybody who has sent a positive comment. It's the most joyous part of my job is when I can connect with people and interact with people and share learnings. It's, it's the key piece that I love. And I suppose today, I thank you for the opportunity to do that and the opportunity to, to link with international colleagues and I encourage you to use any of ours, but please share with me because we're always open to learning. The other thing that I notice has come through is, uh, and what's really lovely about uh, linking with colleagues is that the voice of older people is so important. We've talked about ageism, we've talked about representation, we've talked about measures for nursing homes and talked about loneliness. And people are keen to learn how can we combat that and how can we address that. So that's always the most, uh, I suppose, encouraging part is that we never leave any person behind. Um, housing has come up today. I'm very, very passionate about housing, particularly in the plan, uh, the, the plan policy. Housing and planning are two of the areas that I really think are going to change the fabric and the landscape of our countries. So I welcome any learnings on that, but really glad to welcome the questions on that because we're all thinking the same. And the last thing, uh, I suppose, is just the piece about uh, Slauncher Care. And I'm so delighted that somebody um, actually referred to that policy 
because I really believe that this is our vision for Ireland in terms of how we reform um, care model and the way we've done things. If we go back to Henry Ford, who said that if he'd have done what people asked it, he'd have just uh, got made the horses go faster as opposed to developing the motor car. And that's the way we think we need to be innovative. And I think that plan is going to be, but it means that everybody else is thinking beyond the pandemic. When life goes back to normal and social distancing is a thing of the past, what learnings are going to inform to make things better for the future, not just for our current population, but for our children and our grandchildren coming up. So that's my, my takeaways from today, Jane. Look, thank you, thank you very much. And it's been a, such a pleasure to have you on the call. So as I, when I introduced Catherine, I talked with her about a, being a champion and a visionary and a, and a listener and a builder of relationships. And throughout this webinar, you know, we've become connected in a unique and possible way. Um, you know, we're in our eighth week, coming up to our ninth week in Toronto, working from home, and I've become quite reflective. And so here are two quotes from Margaret Reed that I want to leave you with. But before I do, I want to just mention that next week's webinar is about long-term care, good practices in long-term care within the framework of COVID. And anybody that's uh, been looking at what's happening in long-term care settings in Australia will, be know will know that there's something good happening there and we need to know about it. There's less than 100 people that have died in, uh, in Australia and only one facility has been impacted with the deaths of older people. So join with us. But as I close, Margaret Mead said, our humanity rests upon a series of learned behaviors woven together into patterns that are infinitely fragile and never directly inherited. The way to do field work is never to come up for air until it is all over. So let's stay together and not come up for air until it's all over. So thank you very Wonderful. much. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks very much, Catherine. Bye. Thank you. My pleasure. Bye.